Hey guys, good morning and welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. If you're new here, my name is Jess. I'm so glad you're here. And if you're not new here, I'm also glad you're here. Today we are doing the late May garden tour. And today I'm gonna to take you through my garden and show you how it's growing uh, here in the Midlands of South Carolina, zone eight. Uh, the garden is already pretty advanced and I will tell you on the front end of this tour, I usually like to get it all cleaned up and tidied and have it looking its absolute best to do garden tours. But we've been having an incredibly wet spring. In fact, today I think I have enough time to get this video shot, but I do not have enough time to clean the garden and get the video shot. And it's a bit of a mess in there, I'll be honest. We've, we've been planting in the rain, working in the rain, it's rained all week. The benefit of that is everything's growing really well. Of course the plants love the rain. But you know what, this is real life. This is how gardens grow. Sometimes they're a mess, especially on rainy weeks. And I'm fine with just showing you how it actually is. I started doing these regular tours in the 2018 garden season and have been doing them regularly since then of course my garden's grown since then I've grown as a gardener and there are a lot more of you here now than there used to be then even still I find this incredibly valuable to be able to share with you the things that we're struggling with the solutions that we're finding to our problems the wins that we're having because while it's true we might not have a neighbor next door in our generation that can pass down all their gardening tips. We do have uh, this wonderful technology to connect us. And so if my gardening journey can help you on yours, I'm glad to do that. And if nothing else, it's just nice to walk through a garden on a foggy, wet spring morning, right? All right, so we're gonna come here on the end. This is the end of the whole garden belt. It goes all the way down there to where the high tunnels are and we'll make our way down there. We'll start here what I consider the beginning. My coffee's too hot to drink right now so I just brought it out with me. I've started plugging in some different basil starts. These were all started from seed. I'm dealing with some really heavy pest pressure right now but this is not uncommon when you first transplant things to get like a lot of pests on them but usually what happens is the plant still grows in strong and it's fine so I've not done anything to try to prevent that on this side um, I've got some big heirloom slicers these are still laying down because whenever I tied up plants a few days ago they were not quite reaching the trellis yet I could probably give them a little support now I told you we were gonna be cleaning as we go most of these are plants I got from a local friend of mine. I had some trouble with my seeds stunting. Um, they're ready to plant out now, but these are, she gave me some so I wouldn't be so terribly behind. A lot of these are like Dr. Witchies. We've got some brandy wines. That's like a Hungarian heart. So I'm excited about this. I was pointed this little faciated blossom out on a vlog the other day and I decided to leave it and keep it. And that might be one of our first big tomatoes we get this year. Here's the brandy wine. You can see it has potato leaf uh, foliage. You can tell the difference in this leaf versus this leaf. But all the tomatoes are looking really good. Of course, we have pruned the bottom, which is probably a good thing with all of this moisture we've been getting, but everything still looks really healthy. One of the things with this heavy pest pressure has been a lot of my seedlings are coming and getting eaten. I have seen a lot of roly polies. One time I mentioned in a video about roly polies eating seedlings and I had so many people say, don't you say that people will kill them and they don't actually eat seedlings. I, they do eat seedlings. Um, roly polies eat seedlings. That's, that's definitely true. <laughs> um, I've actively seen them all over seedlings eating them. And I have a lot of roly polies here. That might be what's doing it. I'm just going to start my seeds in the greenhouse and move them out here. I, I did go ahead and direct sow some more as well, but I've already sown twice before and the seedlings just keep coming up and then going away. Usually the leaves are gone and the little bit, like there's just a stem left. So I, that's why I assume that it's some sort of insect because birds would just pluck the whole seedling up. Here I have some lovely, just regular old green tomatillos. I got these, they were really small little plants at the local plant sale. I put three in, you do need to have at least two tomatillos to get any fruit because they do require another plant for pollination. My first year growing them, I just, I only put one in because I didn't know this was years ago. And they just kept setting flowers and then they'd fall off. And I was like, man, what is going on? And I grew it all year before I learned that I needed another plant. And then the next year I planted two plants, but then one, my goats got in my garden. And so they ate 
they ripped up one of my tomatillos. So ever since the goat year, I learned my lesson and I always plant at least three plants now. And, um, oh wow, look at that. There's some down there that are far along. But yeah, I always plant three to make sure if something happens to one, I'll still get fruit. Um, over here, I just did like a quick row of beets. It's a little late in the year here for that, but I just kind of wanted to see what would happen here in South Carolina. I've never tried to grow them through the summer in South Carolina. Uh, that's why it's just a small space. Uh, but I wanted to see because it has been so rainy and if that were to continue, if we have a really wet year. I follow this guy on um, YouTube called Ryan Hall. Y'all is his channel and he breaks down weather patterns and all this stuff. And he was actually explaining about how the predicted weather patterns for this year are going to mean a really wet and cooler year here in the south. And I figured I could throw in some beet seeds on that just to see what would happen. So that's what that is. There's just some bull's blood beets. This is a Thai basil, which I've got basil everywhere. One, pollinators love it. Two, I love making basil tea. Uh, so we have lots of different varieties. These are just some zinnias I threw in. Here is another instance of my seedlings getting knocked back. So that's replanted. That's a sweet passion melon. And another melon here called lemon drop, which is a really small personal melon. And obviously these are going okay. So when you start gardening, of course, you're offsetting different parts of your grocery budget. If you have five sons, by the way, your grocery budget is large. Um, they're so hungry. And one of the big things that feels hard to offset in the garden for kids is like snacks. Now, some of my kids will come down and just snack on cherry tomatoes. They'll come down and grab cucumbers and snack on the other stuff in the garden. But of course, we have the battle with the sweet tooth and all of my kids will eat melons. And so I grow a lot of those. I don't really seek to preserve them a ton. Um, I think there are ways that you can use them in more rounded out meals, like making melon salads. I have done like freeze pops before where you blend uh, the melon flesh in with like some Greek yogurt and some honey and then you put it in a popsicle mold to make a popsicle and that's really good. But of course you're not going to preserve like tons of melon that way. But for the most part we're eating these melons fresh as they come out and just snacking on them and it's kind of one of those free reign things where my kids don't have to ask and they can eat that pretty much at any time of day if they want to go harvest melons and cut them up and eat them. So you'll hear me talk a lot about different places where I'm growing small melons. It's for the purpose of snacking. So I've spaced the peppers out all over the garden and I've tried to keep them in general places where they are with like heat. So these are all peppers that I would grab to saute up in like a, a breakfast scramble. So I've got some, these are called candy cane. They're like really cool variegated. It's not showing a ton of color just yet. I've got a couple of those. Um, this one's a small snacking bell pepper. These are called sweet heat and it's a variety. I found I didn't start these from seeds. I got these at a local plant sale, but it's supposed to be like 500 Scoville. So really mild heat. Scoville rating is how you rank the heat of peppers. So like a jalapeno for reference is between 2,000 and 8,000 is what I've read. I know that's a really wide range, but like a, like a Carolina Reaper is like 40, 50,000 or something like that, like crazy high. So for 500 Scoville, that just means it's not a, purely a sweet pepper. It's just barely got any heat to it at all. And that's the kind of thing I want to eat in my breakfast. Don't give me the hot peppers until I've woken up. Here, these are pepperoncinis. So any of these I could come out and harvest a handful of them, go back in and, and cook with them. On this side, I've got a couple of eggplants. This is one of my favorite basils, but you cannot start it from seed. It's called a uh, I think it's Perpetua. I can't, it's a, it's a variegated basil and it doesn't go to seed. Um, it'll get really, really big. You have to buy it as plants because obviously you can't save seeds for it. Um, I do take cuttings from this and you can do this with any basil. You can take cuttings at the end of the year and keep it in water. Um, plant small plants just over the winter in your house and then start again fresh with the cuttings that you took. But I really like that one because here in sunny South Carolina um, and where I was gardening previously in Arkansas, it's hot. And basil's g growing straight to seed has kind of been a big issue for us. So finding something that doesn't is actually kind of nice. Toast. 
And there she goes to fuss it. Back. Oh, no, friends. So here are all the cherry tomatoes. This row is all cherry tomatoes. Uh, one notable thing that I'm doing this year that I've not grown in a while is this is a yellow pear tomato. And I was actually just noticing that it had some black spots on it. Maybe, maybe this is just from all the rain because I'm seeing this on a couple of the plants. All right, so first let me explain about the yellow pear tomato. Um, I swore off that tomato when I was in Arkansas because every single time I grew it, it got sick, all the fruit split, and I didn't think they tasted very good. Um, but I have decided to retry some things that other people love. People love the yellow pear tomato. People rave about the yellow pear tomato. So with gardening, sometimes we just have to assume that the problem is somewhat exclusive to us. If other people are raving about it and we're not having a great experience with it, sometimes it's how we're growing it. Maybe we're overwatering. maybe we're not giving it the right support. Uh, maybe there's something that they're doing that we could do to have a better experience of a variety, or maybe it's really just not compatible with the region we live in. To be honest, South Carolina is not that different from Arkansas in growing zones and conditions it's very similar i don't know that the yellow pear tomato is going to do just tons better here rather than there but i figured i'd give it a try because it's always a puzzle to me when people go on and on about how great that is because i had such a bad experience with it so i was noticing this kind of like black spotting on the underside of some of these leaves talk about when you see spots or discoloring or things like that on your plants because this is the time of year that a lot of new gardeners start messaging a lot posting a lot honestly kind of freaking out when they see spots like that on their plant sickness happens in a garden because you can't control everything I understand why the commercial industry took the step that it took into what it does as far as like lots of high tunnel growing and growing lots of hybrids and doing lots of things to try to have more control over the conditions to avoid things like sickness and loss of harvest. Now, of course, we talk about store-bought tomatoes taste like disappointment because the further you go into those growing practices, you do lose flavor in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of cases, whenever you start prioritizing durability and the guarantee of a profitable harvest, you prioritize that and sometimes flavor falls to the wayside. And so there is a certain amount of like give and take that's required. If you're going to grow your tomatoes out in the sun, not in a high tunnel shade cloth, if you're going to let rain fall on them instead of keeping them covered where you have complete total control over the watering. If you're going to garden organically and therefore you are going to deal with pests to some degree, there's just, there's just a measure of risk where we can't expect things to look picture perfect because we are prioritizing flavor and experience and ecosystem. So when I see spots on my plants at first, I do absolutely nothing. It's time to just pay attention and watch. So like all that spotting on my tomato leaves, my first guess would be it's rained all week. The other day I was out here planting. After a few hours, my fing fingers got wrinkly because my body was responding to the fact that it was sitting in constant wetness. Likely, but, you know, plants are going to have a, a biological response to being in, you know, constant wetness as well. So probably it's fine. Best to just be very attuned. And some sickness you can do things about, but a lot of sickness you can't. Um, a lot of sickness, once it comes on, you can prune off the sick parts and sometimes a plant will recover. If you come out and a plant is completely wilted and given up, um, a lot of times the best thing to do is just rip that out of your garden and plant something else in that spot. Uh, that way that there's, there's no chance that it's going to spread. There's a hummingbird. Oh, it flew off. I'm just showing you. <laughs> All of that to say, give it the best you've got and uh, be very aware, be present. You have to go in your garden daily if possible is gonna make a really big difference on catching things like that. Give the best conditions you can, but if I have to prune off a bunch of those leaves or if I even lose some of those plants, I'm gonna know that I'm prioritizing flavor and experience and ecosystem so I can see things like hummingbirds. I'm gonna, I'm prioritizing this as a whole rather than 
pushing further into having more control. I love control. I love having control and growing. I have high tunnels. I love high tunnels. I love that they give you control. But I will tell you that my tomatoes that are grown out here and that are picked in the sun, ripened, for all those sugars to concentrate, it's three o'clock on a sunny afternoon, it's 90 degrees, you pick that tomato off. In my high tunnel, grown by my hand with my practices, covered in shade cloth, they don't taste as good. It, they just don't. It's great. I use those more for salsa and sauces, but as far as just eating a fresh tomato, the ones grown out here, they taste better because they had more sunshine on them, but they also had rain on them. So I deal with that. It's give and take. The main thing you can do is be attentive and don't expect your garden to look perfect. It's not going to. And I would say actually that most of these plants look really, really healthy. I do have a little bit of that spotting, but no, it's raining. We're gonna keep going for right now. Y'all just see my hair get really frizzy. Down here are some of my wild boar farms varieties. I'm super excited about these. They look beautiful and very healthy. These actually don't have any spotting. Oh, hello zucchini. This bed is all okra. This has had a really slow start because it hasn't really gotten very hot yet. Okra is gonna start slow until it gets hot. That is old Alabama red okra. It is my favorite one. In Texas Hill Country, they're very similar. I think Star of David is another one that's like kind of squatty. And I don't know how much fried okra I'm gonna be able to eat this year, having to be on a restricted diet for my health stuff. But I might be able to squeak in a little bit, uh, maybe figure out some way to make it uh, grain free. But it, I love fried okra. And I love that thick okra for frying because you, you cut it into these, these discs and they're really wide and it's just really cool. All right, here I've got some nasturtiums. These are just a mixed variety of zinnias that are coming up. Um, I put a couple of squash down here. I will succession sow squash and just put new plants in a few at a time all over the garden and just try to stay ahead of the squash bugs and stay in harvest for as long as possible. Uh, this is my cucamelons. Got some here, got some over there. Uh, they kind of wash down to this side and I'm just letting them all germinate and then I'll probably pluck a few of them out and move them up. And in the middle here, this is sweet alyssum. And I pulled these out because I was getting ready to replant something uh, more ornamental in my green stalks. These were from seed in the green stalks. And I just pulled them out of the green stalk and stuck them over here. Sweet alyssum is a brassica actually. It's part of the brassica family. Um, it is edible flowers, leaves and all. It's not exactly delicious. It's not gross. It's a little gross. It tastes like it honestly it, it tastes better when it's cold outside just like all brassicas. It tastes like a really pungent broccoli. That's what that tastes like. That's the best way I know how to describe it. But I grow alyssum here because it is really good living mulch. Right now these plants are just stuck in here, uh, but they'll spread out. The seeds will grow. They'll spread out all throughout here. Sweet alyssum has what's called uh, partitioning roots, which means that when other plants grow, their roots grow around the other plants. So it doesn't compete with the things that it grows around. It also is frost hardy. So this will take hold. And then when the frost comes and kills out a lot of the garden, this will remain, it'll still bloom. And that's kind of nice. Because where I live, um, it's very common for it to freeze at night, but then we can still have 70 degree days. So a lot of times you still have pollinators foraging uh, when there's not a lot for them. So I like growing things that continue to bloom throughout the cold months because the pollinators are still out looking for something where I am. So anyway, I put it under there because if I don't grow something under that trellis, I'm gonna have to uh, weed it. And by having the sweet alyssum underneath there, it'll choke out any weeds. Here, I've got a sunflower. I don't know what kind this is. This volunteered in my high tunnel from last year and I just dug it up and moved it here. Um, on this trellis, I have my Kajari melons, which I love so much, and I'm so excited to have them here in my new garden. In this area, these are my dragon tongue bush beans. These are bush, but they do have some runners, so you can kind of start to see them stretching up. So I stuck a little piece of a cattle panel in there. They'll probably grab hold here some, and it should be fine. I did throw a couple of sunflowers in here as well, moved down from the high tunnel and these dragon tongue bush beans will probably climb all over these, which will be kind of cool looking. I would like it better if this one would stand up this way. 
because otherwise if you've got something that's climbing like a bush bean or a cucumber and you have something like a sunflower if the sunflower isn't supported or strong before these get big they'll pull it over and they'll lay it down and just bury it they'll climb all over it till it's pretty much tied to the ground all right here are snacking peppers as i said i was kind of putting these by variety um these are like sweet banana peppers some little sweet they're kind of like those ones you get at the store is what they reminded me of they were, they were called pretty and sweet but they're those small colorful peppers that you see at the store in bags my idea here with the snacking peppers as well as the cherry tomato row right here where we sit would be that we could enjoy snacks while we sit and visit and down here uh, more of the variegated basil. I had two plants, so I'll put one here and one over where I showed you guys the other one. Sunflowers, again, move from the high tunnel. And then all of these are sweet peppers of different varieties. Um, and they have not like exploded with growth yet because again, it's been, peppers do not like this weather that we're having. But as soon as it really heats up, these guys will take off. On this side, I have more slicer tomatoes, some of which are a little bit smaller varieties. like. Some of these are kind of like San Marzano's and Roma's. This is one Arkansas traveler in uh, honor of my home state. Oh, so here's a cool example of something. Do you see this tomato growing? <laughs> Little weird protrusion. Um, that was from a faciated blossom. That's what, when I talk about tomatoes being fused together, Oh, well, fooey. I didn't mean to knock that off, but there you have it. That's two tomatoes growing together, and this is where face, what fasciated blossoms can do. But the thing is, is that sometimes these places where they're fused, you'll get these like hollow holes, and they'll rot inside, and so it'll ruin the fruit. So that's why I always pluck off really big fused blossoms. If it looks like pretty tidily just two fused together, I'll leave it. But um, if, it's, if it's quite a few, sometimes you'll see like four or five fused together. And I just feel it, it might be novelty and you might want to grow it just to see what happens, in which case more power to you. But like you are taking a risk that that plant's going to put a lot of energy into a fruit that's not going to be edible for you. Here's my chamomile and it's actually, uh, chamomile doesn't like it when it gets really hot. So you can see that this is really starting to struggle. It was really beautiful for a little while. So I'm probably going to chop and drop this, lay it all down, and then it'll all grow back. This is going to be a chamomile bed now until the end of time because of chamomile going to seed here in this bed. Next to it here is my rhubarb. Um, again, this has kind of, it hasn't exactly thrived in our weather, but it's still here. So I, I expect maybe we'll have better luck with it in the future. These are two bushes that are called cherry berries. It's something that Will had found. Um, and we stuck them in here. I'm not expecting to get anything from them this year. That's a perennial thing. And then here are, uh, this is a mint, another kind of mint. And then that's a lemon balm. These are all plants that are incredibly um, invasive if given the opportunity, which is why they're in this bed. Because I love mint and lemon balm. They're excellent medicinal herbs and they're great to have but you, do, you don't want to just plant these out in a space that you hope to grow other things in the future. This is really picking up. Well, we'll continue this later because it is getting to the point that I can actually see heavier rain coming in from the other side of my property. We'll be back later. I, I ended the first part of this video about two and a half hours ago, edited it, spent some time with Asher this morning because he turned 16 today, which is really awesome, and um, got myself back together to come back out because it finally stopped drizzling, got down here, and it started raining again. So we're going to take a quick drive down here. I'm going to give you a few glances, and then we're going to walk through the high tunnel because we can actually do that undercover. And I can tell you that the next garden tour will be just darling. <laughs> This garden is gonna explode with all this rain. I just want to finish the video so I can get it up for you uh, because frankly it's the end of May. We have birthdays and graduations and all kinds of things that make it kind of crazy. So in the drizzle you can see that the cottage garden is gorgeous. I'm completely smitten with it. I didn't get to the other side of the raised bed garden but 
there's there's frankly not a ton going on there um, other than things that are just on the brink of being harvested and a lot of seeds I've filled in a lot of seeds that haven't come up yet oh I really can't with this space though isn't it gorgeous plus bear's tail so the potato garden is right here. Um, the potatoes are coming along, a lot of blossoms being set. They should start dying back and be ready to begin harvesting here in a few weeks. You'll see the tarp in the middle. That's the sweet potato patch. Um, we'll probably plant those out another maybe two weeks from now. They need 120 days and we have a very long season so putting those out at the end of may beginning of june works for us to still be able to harvest them and keeping that patch covered during this really really rainy time i'm hoping will help with the weeds because there are weed seeds in the soil there and having them covered when it's hot during the days i'm hoping it'll force some of the germination the problem is you put the sweet potato slips in and a lot of times the weeds get a foothold before the the sweet potato slips really take off so i want to make sure it's good and warm before i put the slips in and also that maybe that soil has had a chance to solarize a little more with those um, silage tarps on them. Well, I guess one benefit of a rainy garden tour is to show how our contours are working there. Stay out of the garden. Stay back. Thank you, sir. Um, good boy. So as you can see, the water standing still in the rows. We want this. This is so good. It means it's working. Um, we planted this garden on contour because it is over here kind of away from all where all our watering is. We've been using a sprinkler, but this means we're going to have to water it less because it is making the most out of the water that falls on it. Um, as you can see, all of our chicken and dumplings cow peas are coming up. There's sunflowers grown throughout here as well. There's lots of squashes. We're still planting. Some of this is not planted yet, but this is going to be wild and is also going to be a lot of food. I'm very excited for this. So we'll cover this space more in depth next week um, when it's not raining. Put a lot more seeds out here this week, so it should have more things popping up. And we're just continuing to mulch the walkways and keep the weeds down. In the high tunnel, the biggest note is, of course, our peppers. And with these, like this whole bed is Craig's Grande Jalapenos. And actually this, I am assuming that this is a mistake um and that this was just a seed that got mixed in but i'm keeping an eye on it because this is definitely a variegated plant now i do have some fish peppers so there's a very good chance that this just is a mistake and this is not a jalapeno but if this turns out to be a variegated jalapeno i'm totally saving seeds from it this bed is mixed of different varieties as you can see the peppers are planted pretty closely together when they get a little bit bigger i'm thinking we're going to do some sort of like weaving twine we'll probably put tea posts in the corner and just allow some support um peppers don't always need support but i like to go ahead and give it on the front end because if the f the plant gets very heavy laden with fruit a lot of times when you go to pick them um the branches will break off because they're so heavy laden and so adding some support just guarantees that that's not going to happen and it doesn't take much to support a whole bed like this i can put some posts or rebar in the corner and just weave some thin rope or twine in between them another mixed bed look at this so we've harvested so many artichokes and i've kind of just been letting these go and these are getting ready to bloom and i'm so excited artichoke blooms are gorgeous so artichokes are relatives of the sunflower family and um what you're eating here when you eat the choke it's the bud before it opens up and it's like this really neat looking purple flower so i'm cool i'm excited to let those go and bloom more peppers down here and the rest of this is empty space i've got a lot more peppers out in the greenhouse that we're going to transplant out here back here is my ginger and look it's coming up this is cool i'm very excited to see this this whole back row is planted with ginger that's just grass but a lot of this is the ginger coming back i would love to see this full of ginger and get a really good harvest this year this whole row is going to be peppers so i was talking about control and the flavors of things and i put a lot of my sweet peppers out in the garden because when it comes to fruit being in the sun is going to 
magnify the sweetness specifically, but the flavor of the fruit. So hot peppers that are grown out in the sun are going to end up being more intense in that flavor, whereas grown in here, they're going to be less intense, but especially the sugar. So if you're really wanting a really good sweet pepper, a really good sweet tomato, putting them out in the sun is going to give you that more than the high tunnel. However, things will probably grow better, more consistently, more healthily in the controlled environment. So that's why I've got lots of peppers in here, but some out there. I thought about putting some tomatoes in here, but I've already got so many tomatoes out there. I don't really feel like that's necessary. Maybe a couple of plants because they'll last a lot longer in here, not under all the rain. And maybe just to have a little bit after the rest peter out, but I may just not do that. All right, our unforecasted rain shower is now coming down very hard and I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this tour up a little short. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today on this lovely rainy morning in my beautiful garden. I look forward to tracking the progress with you guys um, as we go throughout the growing season. If there's anything you'd like to see specifically, questions that you have, areas you'd like for me to focus on in the next tour, please leave a comment down below. I'd love your feedback. Thank you for hanging out with me today. I bless you. Until next time.